Hello. Now, I'm sorry we're running a little bit late. Um, so thank you very much to all of you who've stayed. The things I'm going to cover, um, I've heard quite a lot throughout the day and throughout some of the panel discussions. So it gives me a little bit of comfort um, that I'm not mad in the things I'm about to say and the things that I think. Um, hopefully, it won't be dull as ditch water for you to hear some of the same themes. So, I guess you might know who I am, but I'll say it anyway. I'm Amanda Hall, and I'm Network Rail's engineering expert for systems. A slightly embarrassing job title, I'm afraid, um, but we get slightly odd ones from time to time. I joined British Rail as a graduate trainee about 23 years ago, and I've worked in various technical roles ever since. I'm also a single mother to a seven-year-old son. So today I'd like to share with you some of the things that Network Rail are doing in the realm of women in science and engineering. So who are we? Well, we're a company of about 35,000 people. And we own, manage and operate Great Britain's rail infrastructure network. This includes innovation, design, installation, operation, maintenance and renewal of things like track, signalling, telecoms, electrical supplies, bridges, tunnels and earthworks and a few stations thrown in as well. And all the data and information systems which support these. So as you can see, it's quite broad and quite varied. As you can imagine, we've got a few business challenges. Compared with 10 years ago, we've one million more trains carrying one billion more passengers, all running on a network that was never designed for such numbers. And despite our recent levels of investment, much of the network is currently running at 100% capacity. Meanwhile, passenger expectations are higher than ever and the government is under pressure to reduce our funding. So we need to deliver more for less money. All of this has to be achieved whilst maintaining our position as one of the safest railways in Europe. So we want higher performance, lower costs and better safety. Not much really. And we believe that having a more diverse and inclusive workforce is one of the things that we need to do to help us achieve this. As you've heard today, there's a proven correlation across multiple sectors and geographies between diversity and inclusion on one hand and innovation and high performance on the other. And we could do with a bit of that. Our chief executive, Mark Kahn, spent much of his career in the oil and gas industry. And using his experience, and we heard a little bit from Myrtle about hers um, in about the same time frame, he sees the correlation between diversity and inclusion and safety and performance. When women started becoming a much more visible presence on the oil and gas platforms in the North Sea about 20 years ago, the difference they brought was profound. The extreme macho and frankly unsafe culture that was a hallmark of the industry in the 1970s and 80s changed dramatically and forever. In fact, from a railway perspective, I remember being a British Rail graduate trainee 20 odd years ago. And whilst I met lots of lovely, welcoming, warm people who were very supportive. I also came across a few who were not so. I remember one occasion on a night shift on a construction site in the middle of nowhere when someone spat in my face and was swinging a crowbar at my legs. Not particularly pleasant individual. 
So that's hardly the sort of environment to foster better safety and performance. But I'm glad to say that we no longer have a culture where that sort of behaviour would be tolerated. So now a few statistics. We like a few stats, don't we? In the UK, about 45% of the working population are women. But women hold only about 12% of the labour market in science, engineering and technology sectors. And only one in seven of those studying engineering are women. In Network Rail, the percentage of women has gone from 12% in 2006 to 16% today. So we are getting better, but not very quickly. However, in our engineering roles, the population of women is only 7%, compared with a UK-wide figure of 8.5%, 9%. So at the current rate of recruitment, and with our low staff turnover, it would take almost 65 years for 30% of our workforce to be female, which is seen as the tipping point in order to benefit from diversity of gender. But it's probably a little bit worse than that because women leave our organisation at a faster rate than men. So we don't have a huge turnover of staff, but women leave at about 8% um, compared with only 5% for men. So what are the factors that would attract girls to choose to study engineering in the first place, choose a particular company and want to stay? Some of these things are to do with the job itself, how interesting it is, the pay and the opportunity for career progression. Some of them are to do with life. Life happens. Many women will at some point have a child and giving the ageing population, many of us will at some point in our careers need to care for an ageing relative. I'll touch on some of the things that Network Rail is doing in these areas. So what are we doing to encourage and support women? Actually quite a lot, from engaging with girls in schools through to retaining the more mature mid-career ladies like me. Our chief exec has signed up to the WISE 10-point plan, and we're using it. When in May this year, we assessed ourselves against the plan using the rather nifty tool that we've got, we found that we're doing really well on understanding our failings and understanding our starting point. We've made it a business improvement project, so that's really good too. And we're good at sharing and learning from other people's good practice. We're doing okay on changing mindsets, educating our leaders, and being creative in job design. However, we need to do quite a lot better on flexible working, transparency of opportunity, retaining and developing women, and sponsoring female talent. And we'll continue to use the assessment tool to check our progress along the way. We've also committed to the Cabinet Office's Your Life initiative. And there are a few things here. One is to run the UK-wide Girls in IT, could it or IT be you, competition. And to raise awareness of the competition among 2,000 girls aged 16 to 18 in 2014, 3,000 girls in 2015, and 4,000 girls in 2016. We've also committed to encourage 30% more women to apply to our IT graduate and placement programme by 2018. Through engaging with women on computer science and IT degree courses, and hosting lunches and presentations on university campuses. All students like a good meal, don't they? So we're also working with five secondary schools in the Milton Keynes community, which is where our main offices are based, reaching 500 14 to 18 year old girls per year and two and a half to 3,000 young people by 2018 and running work experience weeks and working through the outreach programmes and mentoring. 
We've also made a commitment to university technical colleges and are supporting the target of attracting 30% female students to join the first intake. And we're going to promote opportunities for female applicants from UTCs to secure careers in technology and engineering by providing appropriate role models and mentors at the point where they're making careers decisions. In terms of apprentices, then we're going to recruit 500 apprentices in the next three intakes and aim to significantly improve attraction rates of females to at least 12%. And we've heard today that of all the ways of attracting people into engineering and STEM subjects, that it's the apprenticeship schemes that, um, that are suffering the most. So together with WISE, a couple of years ago, and I think I saw her in the audience earlier, we jointly commissioned Professor Avril MacDonald, hi, <laughs> to carry out the Not For People Like Me research. This is fed into the way that we attract girls in school to take STEM subjects and consider STEM careers. As part of an ongoing commitment to supporting the talent pipeline from school, Network Rail became the founding sponsor of the People Like Me Wise STEM Careers Resource Pack. We've also had a lot of success with the annual Could It or Could IT Be You competition. As women make up only 17% of the national IT workforce, and a survey of 16 to 24 year old women in Britain revealed that 64% of women had not even considered a career in IT. Could It Be You challenges girls aged 16 to 18 say sort of A-level age, to answer a series of questions about their motivations around the IT industry so that they can compete for a £9,000 prize towards their first year's university tuition in any discipline. And the five runners-up receive paid work experience placements in our organisation. The competition aims to dispel myths around jobs in IT and to encourage girls to consider a career in the sector. The scheme has won various awards, including one for Network Rail as Advocate of the Year at the 2015 Women in, in IT Awards. Actually, we saw a huge increase in the number of girls changing their minds to considering a career in IT. So when the finalists were asked whether they would consider a career in IT after the finalist day, 87% said that they would. Let's have a think about early career. So from the not for people like me research, Professor MacDonald provided targeted recommendations to remove unconscious bias in our advertising, recruitment and selection processes and recommendations on how to enhance the appeal of network rail careers by invoking a sense of belonging in potential applicants. In addition, our in-house emerging talent resourcing team commissioned and conducted research specific to the graduate market to understand the perceptions of Network Rail as a graduate recruiter. We found that knowledge of the role of the company and the wider industry was limited and expectations of careers in rail were low. There's a focus group quote which was, there's a sentiment that the organisation is about maintenance, not development or innovation. It feels limited and contained. So we needed to dispel that. So the objective of the first year of the work was to widen the appeal of Network Rail and the graduate scheme by challenging these misconceptions and dispelling the myths about careers that we offer and the people we employ. The messaging and imagery was overhauled to emphasise the range of careers available and the impact of the work we do and what it does to the wider economy and society. The headline was Network Unlimited in order to convey the fact that you can personally shape your career given the range of disciplines and career paths and the positive support from the company. As we compete for the attentions of talented undergraduate engineers, we focus on the value of the work we do 
and the benefits of society as a whole. In the second year of the campaign, then we developed the look and feel of it to include our current undergraduates and reflect our inclusive and supportive culture. We invested in photography, videos and people profiles to showcase our current graduate engineers. Traditional advertising was supplemented by local and national press articles focusing on the personal stories and careers of some of our more experienced and successful engineers. All of our people's stories focused on the culture of Network Rail and included people's colleagues, the support they receive and what they get up to outside work, things like volunteering. This advertising campaign was backed up by increased interaction on the ground. On campus, we built relationships with engineering departments and were able to run bespoke sessions in lectures with a focus on some of the soft skills like communication and interview techniques. So did it work? Well, over these two years, we increased the proportion of women across all graduate schemes from 24% to 29%. And for engineering, we, for us, have reached a high of 15% of female graduates. Um, we can only dream of the figures that Bechtel went through earlier, but 15 we were skipping about. When compared to the UK engineering undergraduate market as a whole, we know that this is pretty good, as apparently 15.8% of engineering and technology undergraduates are female. And especially when you consider that not all of these students go on into engineering graduate schemes. However, we were also aware that our advertising can only take us so far and that actually our selection process must also be open and inclusive. So we've tried a few things to reduce bias in the selection process. Blind shortlisting, unconscious bias training for assessors and the combination of scores from multiple exercises to remove any personal bias. These interventions worked, but as we have become more targeted in our messaging to specific demographics, we've had to take a more tailored approach to assessment to address things like cultural bias affecting specific groups. So, for example, the traditional psychrometric tests that many of us will have done at some point have now been replaced by a gamified ability test to reduce anxiety and cultural bias. The number of participants in the group exercise has been reduced from eight to four in order to encourage participation from all candidates. Something that we were seeing was that often women would feel reticent to speak up if there were already a lot of um, often males talking. All of our selection tools have been adapted to be better predictors of success at network rail, rather than focusing on past experience. So time will tell how successful these changes have been. But we've learnt that in order to have a truly inclusive recruitment process, we must be aware of people's differences, rather than to be blind to them. But it's not just about graduate recruitment though, is it? We want to retain the women that we already have in the business. This means creating the right environment for them to thrive by removing the barriers to progression. And some of these barriers that we've identified, and to some extent this is washing our dirty laundry in public, is the lack of female role models, unconscious bias, there being fewer opportunities for flexible working at a senior level, marginalisation of people due to part-time working, leadership training that is residential, lack of transparency for secondments, acting up and project allocation, lack of transparency of succession planning, gender-biased perceptions of what makes a good leader, and we had a brilliant example from Myrtle earlier, that she didn't look like one, and a lack of access to network and sponsors. 
So perhaps some of you have come across a few of these and recognised them from your own industries. So what are we doing? Well, on unconscious bias, we're starting, we're starting to tackle it. And so far, 4,000 of our leaders have been through our inclusive leadership programme, which includes learning on unconscious bias and how bias impacts on the assessment of our people's performance. It also includes tools for the better management of bias. What about flexible working? That's one of the areas that we're not doing too well on. Well, we have a policy on flexible working. And guess what? It's the law as well. So from the 30th of June 2014, all employees were able to request flexible working, regardless of the reason for the request. And previously, the requests to work flexibly were only made on grounds of childcare or um, other caring responsibilities. But our revised policy went beyond the requirements of the legislation in that it was made available to all workers regardless of their start date. So that was a couple of years ago. So earlier this year, we sponsored some research to look at the uptake and success of it. The study concluded that we need to focus more on promoting flexible working, identifying internal champions to promote working flexibly on a local basis and provide guidelines to manage and support the employees who do. We should also ensure that our managers have adequate training and support to implement and monitor the policy. HR need to reflect on identifying skill shortages in jobs where different skills patterns could help fill gaps, consult with recruitment on flexible job search tools and offer flexible options when recruiting. The research that we did included a survey of more than 2,000 of our staff. And here are some of the findings. Nearly 40% of the respondents were not aware of the extension to the right to request flexible working since its introduction two years ago. The awareness was actually a little bit higher in men than in women. Almost a fifth of the employees surveyed who were eligible to make a request had done so in the past two years. And the rate of refusal of those requests was actually very low. It was only five and a half percent. The main grounds for requesting flexibility were childcare needs and spending time with family. And the leading reasons for not requesting flexibility were contentment with current working arrangements. That's a good thing but also lack of awareness of the right to request. So 38% of the respondents had some suggestions on how we could do flexible working more effectively within Network Rail. And here are some of the ideas. Having clear policy guidelines, training, raising awareness, clear, consistent communications, management support, managing outputs, not ours, and that's a big one, tackling cultural barriers and endorsement from senior executives. And these were considered critical for the successful implementation of a flexible working policy. They also recognised that having this policy aids recruitment and retention, and that there's a positive correlation between flexible working, recruitment and retention. So it seems that we have the right policy in place and it even goes beyond the prevailing legislation. But we still have some way to go to embed it in our culture. There are some other things that we're doing. There's a thing that you will have noticed and a theme, which you're holding up the stop card, and I'm sorry. I know, I know we're running late, but I still have quite, quite a way to go. Does it matter too much? Okay, Sorry. right. We'd we'll be able to share your presentation. Just if you wrap it up now, is that all right? Yeah. Yeah, I can. Well, you'll be able to read about our engineering capability framework, um, which is a fabulous thing. And, um, and Fiona in the audience will be disappointed that I didn't manage to, to go through it with you. And it's um, something that gives 
a clear roadmap and clarity to all engineers, whether they're male or female, as to the skills, capabilities and experience that they need to have in order to go for different roles and career progression within the organisation. And something key about it is that it shows explicitly which things you need to have before you go for a job and which things can be developed and learnt once you're in the job. So, I'll go straight to conclusions. Simply recruiting more women to Network Rail will not, on its own, improve safety and performance. It is part of the answer, but by adding inclusion to the mix, so that these women's voices and opinions are heard, and expertise harnessed, we can realise the benefits to safety and performance. Most barriers to the recruitment and progression of women can be reduced by removing unconscious bias from the organisation. Things like our presenteeism culture, our heroic culture, and also some of the structural barriers, like training courses, which are residential, and the lack of flexible working. Solving these doesn't just help women, it actually helps everyone. By supporting women into leadership, we ensure that their diversity adds value at a leadership level and will also then provide role models for other women. So for my part, I've had an interesting and rewarding career in the rail industry, and I love the fact that we contribute to society and the country's economy. I've seen attitudes change, thankfully, over the past 20, 10, even five years. And nowadays, I feel much less awkward mentioning that I have childcare responsibilities when colleagues are arranging times and locations for meetings. And I know that it's completely fine and that I shouldn't feel awkward at all. We've had some successes, probably the major of which are to be honest about our challenges, to know how much further we need to go and to put strategies in place to get there. We know it won't be quick. We have 35,000 people, low staff turnover rates and a complex organisational structure, but we are determined to get there and we have to if we're going to be an innovative, high-performing organisation. Thank you.